Permaculture is a portmanteau of permanent agriculture. It was started by Bill Mollison, who was a biologist at the University of Tasmania, and his student, David Holmgren, in 1974. It was a response to deforestation, soil erosion, pollution, loss of biodiversity, and the negative effects of industrial agriculture. What I really love about permaculture is that rather than fighting the institutions of business and industry, they wanted to really find a practical solution. And it reminds me of that Buckminster Fuller quote that you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, you need to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. For two years, Bill Mollison studied nature and indigenous plant tending. He was inspired by nature's interconnectedness, cooperation, and abundance. He aimed to achieve sustainable, regenerative, and self-reliant food production systems. Permaculture evolved to encompass other human systems, and the principles are now applied to ecology, architecture, design, business, and economic, financial, and legal systems. Permaculture recognizes that nature, when left alone, cleans the air, soil, and water, and gives life. Permaculture draws from the natural world and aligns with its inclination to nurture, to be inclusive, and to encourage all parts of existence to harmonize. Solutions that embrace permaculture philosophies foster the healing of people, animals, and the world. Here's a picture of the founders and a quote by Bill Mollison. The overall aim of permaculture design is to produce an efficient, low maintenance, productive integration of plants, animals, structures, and humanity with the ultimate result of on-site stability and food self-sufficiency in the smallest practical area. The aim is also to plan for craft or other products on larger areas that yield a trade or commercial potential for clients. The design should aim for a total, secure, long-term integration of all elements. Stability and diversity are the key notes. Conservation of soil, water, and energy are central issues. The system combines rational landscape design, organic gardening methods, and alternative energy systems into a unified design encompassing many trades, skills, and disciplines. Toby Hemingway, my favorite permaculture teacher, he wrote a, a great book called Gaia's Garden, called permaculture sustainable horticulture because it's more aligned with plant tending than with modern agriculture. He studied anthropology and said that non-agricultural people who tend to plants are very connected to the earth, so much so that they don't have a word for the wild. Bewildered to, means to be confused by the wild. Permaculture can help us connect our lost ties to the earth. There's three core ethics. One of them is caring for people and our communities. This involves choosing the right livelihood, it promotes living with voluntary simplicity, thinking locally, thinking slow, nutritious food, and it's also involved in democratic decision making. I believe spirituality is also promoted through permaculture's recognition of the connection of all things. Earth care is another of the ethics, and permaculture mimics ecosystems. It plays a role in remediation and regenerative systems, it aims to produce no waste. There's thought and care for the future, habitat pres preservation, and respect and reverence for life's interconnectedness and oneness. Sharing the surplus is another ethical principle. It recognizes that nature and people working together create abundance. So it's important that there's no hoarding, that the abundance can flow, that source can flow. Permaculture promotes cooperative ethical business that considers all. Asking yourself, does this action care for the earth? Does it care for the people? Does it return the surplus to the people and the earth? 
are great basic permaculture questions. Permaculture has 12 principles. They are inherently ethical, they come from nature, and they can be applied to any aspect of life, home, business, or relationships. Number one, researching the land, the climate, your zone, your soil type, looking at the native plants you have that could be indicators of what types of conditions you have, learning to think like nature, relinquishing power and order, and also realizing, of course, nature is beautiful, so plan to make your garden that way. Number two, plants can serve many functions. For example, a tree could provide nuts, shade, and a windbreak. A hedge might provide fruit, privacy, and a shelter for wildlife. And you want to integrate your components holistically rather than segregating them. Number three, you want to design for self-reliance as opposed to self-sufficiency because in permaculture fashion, you want to be a part of your community and you want to share and trade and uh, trying to create everything you need is just going to be too much for, for any given person. You want to be able to adapt to weather variances. You want to have many different crops. You want to go low tech, have hand tools so that you can always function. Number four, permaculture is all about polycultures, not monocrops. Variety really is the spice of life. You want to tolerate and embrace weeds, or otherwise known as volunteer plants, and let your garden naturalize to a certain degree. Number five involves very intensive planning and considering placement. For example, you might want to put a, a chicken coop next to a greenhouse to warm it and provide fertilizer. Uh, you might want to put a sauna right inside your greenhouse as well to warm it. And you want to work from larger patterns to detail. Number six, you want to get away from unsustainable industrial systems. Regenerative systems such as living fences are much less work and cost over the long term. Number seven, you want to create closed energy loops and harness resources such as rainwater harvesting. You could do this through the use of swales or ponds, recycling gray water, using gravity to feed water. You also want to conserve your energy with things like chop and drop comfrey and composting in place. Number eight, Pioneer species prepare the soil for the next stages. You might want to take advantage of this and use things like nurse trees to raise your younger trees. You also want to adapt to natural change and accept the feedback from nature. Number nine, you want to work within your means, use long-term planning, and just evolve slowly over time, doing less and working smarter. Number 10, you may have noticed that more life and diversity accumulates around the edges. These might be forest edges, estuaries, water, or roadways. So you wanna maximize this edge effect by using wavy borders, spirals, or ponds. Number 11, the problem is the solution is a, a really popular permaculture quote. Composting food scraps, even using composting toilets is a great idea. You can learn what type of weeds that you have that you can eat. If you have snails in your garden, you might want to invite ducks. And you want to recognize that everything in nature is recycled. Nothing is waste. Number 12, you want to obtain a yield. You might do this by supplementing by eating some wild foods using all the possible layers for growing. We'll get into that in a little while. You want to stagger your yields seasonally and of course share any surplus. So what do permaculture gardens look like? 
You can draw from the principles in different ways and implement them with your own unique approach. In locations where permaculture gardens grow, life flourishes. Fish repopulate streams, birdsong fills the air, and even rare species that were thought long gone from an area have returned. You can combine ancient techniques, modern science and understanding, your intuition. You can plant things you're drawn to, design what you love. You can follow sacred geometry patterns. Patterns in nature tend to be balanced, symmetrical, and non-linear. This makes them very strong since they have no weak corners. Pleasing circles, spirals, and crescent shapes can be found in nature, and emulating them can make your garden healthier and easier to maintain. Branching and fractal patterns are efficient, so are networks of links and nodes, and they're all non-hierarchical, so they have strong connections. Nature moves in curves, and mankind often tries to bring order to the world by making things linear and angular. This tends to weaken them and can be destructive to the natural form. When you consider water, which naturally branches, bubbles, and stays cool under the canopy of bordering trees, it purifies itself as it travels. We force it with great effort into holding reservoirs, into angled pipes. It runs under our linear roads, where it overheats and loses its healthy life force. This lack of vitality is reflected in the fact that the quality of most of our drinking water in cities is rather poor. I believe permaculture gardens are the ultimate creation. It's a changing landscape. It grows. It's alive. It's a canvas that adapts to seasons. It interacts with you. It nourishes you and teaches you. This is the residence of Becky and Bill Wilson. They're the founders of Midwest Permaculture in Cabri, Illinois, and this is their home in 2007. This is what their home looks like 10 years later. They put in a rain catchment system, hazelnut bushes, peach, apple, and cherry trees. They have a big herb garden and they utilize aquaponics. Becky and Bill's permaculture students helped to create a rain catchment system. Rain collected on the roof runs from the drain pipes and into swales. It's then stored in three rain garden ponds in their yard where it soaks slowly into the subsoil. This limits the amount of watering needed it holds around 1,400 gallons of water. It keeps their sidewalk drier and safer in the winter as well. The mounded soil from the digging created interesting contour for the garden. They also created berms on the property edge to hold more water if the rain gardens overflow. The trails in their yard are made of shredded wood you can see a couple of guilds, which are trees and compatible plants grouped together. They chose native prairie plants for the bottom of the rain gardens because they tolerate flooding and dry periods. Here's an aerial view of their design. Now they have a hundred edible and useful plants. Some of them are listed on the left. And they say that the purpose of their work is to support the transition of our society from a culture of consumption into a culture of creation. And they have some really wonderful free booklets on their website. This is a picture of James Prigioni's backyard in Toms River, New, New Jersey. And uh, it only took five years to go from the before to the lush after shot. He used uh, the back to Eden method of um, using a very thick layer of wood chips. And he would just let the wood chips degrade over a year and then pull them away to create little planting holes 
and um, dig down to where they had degraded and there was nice soil underneath the wood chips and he'd put his plants in there and um, the wood chips worked really well just as a, a suppressant for other plants he didn't want popping up. He was also inspired by Masanobu Fukuoka's natural farming techniques. These are based on the Tao philosophy of Wu Wei, which could be translated really loosely as do-nothing farming. So this involves no action against nature, no rushing to fix a problem, no unnecessary pruning, no plowing, no chemicals, and um, in Masanobu's case, no flooding of rice fields. And he had a, a really healthy ecosystem with very high yields and wrote a fabulous book called One Straw Revolution. Here's a picture of James and his seven-year-old dog, Tuck, showing off their bounty of vegetables and fruits from the garden. And um, James does a lot of fantastic videos, really informative, really fun. And uh, Tuck's always walking around with him, eating all the vegetables. As you can see, James Prigioni is really enthusiastic and has a lot of energy. Um, so what happens when land is not disturbed by people? What does it eventually turn into? Well, when land is left alone in most parts of the world, it turns into a forest. In forest succession, each stage prepares the soil and environment for the next. Pioneers are very hardy and can handle harsh elements and extremes in temperature. Each stage provides shelter for the next and some fixed nitrogen as well. Climax forests are stable ecosystems that remain largely unchanged for hundreds of years. And this is where most life exists. I think food forests are really the climax of permaculture. They emulate and perform the functions of natural forests. They're complex symbiotic networks that are self-sustaining. The roots hold nutrients in water. In fact, nearly all fresh water comes from forest watersheds. The trees protect waterways, they fill underground aquifers, and they create springs. They also create humidity, which turns into clouds, which in turn attract higher clouds and make rainfall. They also slow rainfall, prevent runoff, and topsoil loss. They offer protection from floods, storms, and wind. The leaves clean the air. They regulate the temperature. They have a cooling effect in summer and a warming effect in winter. The forests create homes. They invite life. The organic matter builds really good topsoil. There's no tilling, so the soil actually improves over time. The soil life and mycorrhizal fungi networks are left intact. Food forest gardens make use of all the possible layers, so they're efficient and productive. These include the taller canopy layer, a smaller tree layer, a shrub layer, a herbaceous layer, a root crop layer, a ground cover, and also climbers or vines. You could even include a fungal layer for mushrooms and a wetland layer for water-loving plants. Here's some ideas for food forest layers in temperate climates. They include edible hardy perennials, nitrogen-fixing trees and plants, and many of these listed are not commonly cultivated, so you not, might not be able to find these fruits in your local grocery store but they are easy to care for. Midwest Permaculture has some fantastic e-booklets on their website, uh, which you can download there for free, um, including this document here. Food forest gardens are not a new thing. In South and Southeast Asia, 
there are tree gardens that are often hundreds of years old. This is a Candian forest garden in Sri Lanka, and it's very diverse. It includes spices, timber, medicine, food, and fruit, and it's a stable, sustainable system. This is a food forest garden at the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute in Basalt, Colorado. It's at 7,200 feet and it's on a steep rocky hillside. The native forest is pinyon juniper with very dry soils and poor fertility. In spite of this, they've created a productive forest garden. They used sheet mulching, terracing for rainwater collection, chop and drop nitrogen fixers, and mulch plants to build the soil. The soil stores the infrequent rainfall and limited irrigation nicely. They left some islands of original vegetation in the garden for local biological diversity and pest control. Here's another view of the food forest garden. It includes apple, pear, apricot, and plum trees, hawthorn, chokeberry, mountain ash, and mulberry. They planted Siberian pea shrubs, Russian olive, and natives including New Mexico locust, buffalo berry, and mountain mahogany. They also have Nanking cherries, gooseberries, and currants, and beans. The perennials are lovage, comfrey, horseradish, astragalus, mint, and garlic. They also have self-seeding annuals like salad greens, lamb's quarters, and brassicas. When I contacted them, they said they do not have a fence to protect their food forest. Instead, they use plants as deterrents, and they keep a dog on site that acts as a good bear deterrent. Here's a picture of Jerome Ostentowski, who's the founder of Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute. He's giving a tour of his greenhouses, which is what they're actually most known for. Their greenhouses use passive and active solar technology. They call the technology a climate battery. It's a subterranean air circulation system that takes the hot, moist ambient air from the greenhouse during the day stores it in the soil, and discharges it at night. They have two greenhouses, one with tropical, one with subtropical climates. So they grow bananas, papayas, and plenty of exotics. Jerome Ostentowski has a book on how to create the forest garden greenhouse. And if you're interested in learning more about forest gardens, I highly recommend Dave Jack's book, Edible Forest Gardens, as well as Martin Crawford. Um, he's a gardener in the UK, and he grows about 500 species of edible plants in his food forest. And it only takes a few hours of maintenance each month for him to care for them. Ishtel René of 8th and B allowed me to use this diagram of plant functions. In addition to considering layers, you want to choose plants according to the functions they perform. Some plants are edible, some support the ecosystem, and some do both. Ensuring these roles are met makes the plants happy, the soil rich, and the food nutritious. Fertilizers and pesticides are not needed because the system works together harmoniously. The plant functions include nitrogen fixers, which are often in the legume family. Pioneer trees are also nitrogen fixers. These include alder, Russian or autumn olive, silverberry, locusts, red stem dogwood, sea buckthorn, bayberry, and buffalo berry. By dropping leaves and by small roots constantly growing and rotting in the soil, they spread nitrogen. Pollinators is another of the plant functions. You want to aim for blooming all year round. You can use plants and you can also use local flowering trees and bushes. 
Dynamic cumulators are plants that have long roots that mine nutrients from deep within the soil, making them available to others in the ecosystem. These include nettle, yarrow, and lamb's quarters. Repellers are often plants that provide habitat for beneficial insects, such as wasps, that help keep a bug balance in the ecosystem. They can also be plants that animals don't like the smell of. Mulchers are also important for building the soil. These include deciduous trees that produce lots of leaves in the fall, and comfrey and rhubarb are popular mulchers. Suppressors are plants that inhibit grasses. You can plant a ring of them around a fruit tree's drip line so the tree won't be competing with grass for nutrients. Ramps, camas, lilies, and other spring bulbs work well for this. Creating a guild is one way of breaking down a food forest into a smaller chunk so it's easier to design. This guild from the Resiliency Institute shows the layers and plant functions working together. The plants in this guild are compatible with fruit trees. You want to choose plants for your zone, precipitation, and length of growing season. Keep in mind that for every 1,000 feet above sea level, it's approximately 10 degrees Celsius or 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit cooler. Pay attention to soil type but know that adding organic matter will fix most problems. Choose companion plants. There may be some trial and error involved. Choose lots of perennials and self-seeding varieties. If you want to, you can certainly mix in annuals to the guild. You may also want to consider analog climates. The World Köppen classification system can inform you of other areas around the world that have a climate like your own. You can research their native plants and integrate them into your guild or garden. This photo of a fruit tree guild shows how they are mini ecosystems. They are like a small portion of a food forest. I love how they're a manageable size and you can fairly easily protect them from animals until the trees are mature. Bealtaine Cottage is Colette O'Neill's farm, where she is the sole woman involved. It's important to her that there's no helpers. She wanted to prove that one person is all it takes to create a paradise. Her farm is on three acres in West Ireland. She said it had the poorest of soils, was wet, rushy, and north-facing, and it was a monocrop of grass that could only sustain two cows. Here it is 12 years later, with the cottage barely visible. Colette got donations, wrote a book, and raised money to make her dream happen. She said standard agriculture in the area gets numerous grants, but the Irish government ignored funding her project. But now she's planted over 100 deciduous trees, has two large orchards, and around 1,000 species of trees, shrubs, flowers, and vegetables growing at the cottage. Here's a picture of the pond Colette dug before planting. This is the pond in 2018. The plants are interconnected and each tree has multiple functions that benefit the rest of the species and brings balance to the entire land. The soil is rich and fertile. It smells like a lush, dense rainforest. She feels reconnected to the earth. There's a large surplus of food that she makes into jams, wines, pickles, chutneys, and dried foods. This is the lane leading to Bealtaine Farm when Colette first acquired it. This is the lane 12 years later. Colette does podcasting and videos, and she's had thousands of visitors. She has lots of time to enjoy her farm. She says it's an arc for nature. She feels like she's living with the planet rather than on the planet. 
She's now calling it goddess permaculture because it embraces the divine feminine and welcomes all life. Even Colette's cabin uses permaculture principles. She uses recycled materials, as you can tell from the broken tile floor. Part of a permaculture planning strategy involves considering zones, but your zones don't need to be in the bullseye shape shown here. Zone one are your frequently visited areas, and you want these to be close to the house. These might be intensely cultivated herb and kitchen gardens. Perhaps a worm compost could go here. Zone two are regularly cultivated food production areas. You might have large squash here, plants that fruit once, perhaps a greenhouse. Zone three are areas that require occasional care. They might be cash crops visited once a week or orchards or nut trees. Zone four is where you could go foraging, you might cut wood, you could have pasture land, and this area requires minimal care. Zone five is very important. This is where nature is left alone to create the reserves needed for all to flourish. This is where you wanna let the production of bacteria, molds, and fungus take place undisturbed. And this is the place to observe and just get inspired. Permaculture zones can be adapted to an urban living environment. Zones can be used as a way to meet food needs in the city and promote community and regional self-sufficiency. Zone one might be your garden, maybe your yard or pots on your balcony. Zone two could be your community gardens, your neighbor's garden where you might trade food with them, or unused public spaces like churches or abandoned areas. Zone three could be farmer's markets, where you can actually meet the people growing the food. Zone four could be regional local markets. Zone five, finally, could be the chain supermarkets that bring food in from a long distance. Sectors are invisible influences on your site. You want to map where the sun and shade is throughout the seasons. There's apps that can tell you where the sun is at various times of the year. I use one called Lumos. You want to determine where water flows and collects. You want to note where fire zones might be, such as steep areas where fire could spread quickly uphill, and you might want to build a fire break. You want to determine cold areas, such as any low areas where cool air could collect, and also map any microclimates you have. You can apply sectors to influences in the city as well. These could be artificial light, unattractive areas, easements, laws, even expenses. You can choose to block, channel, or open a sector up. Permaculture recommends that you study land for one whole year before working on it. You should list the functions and properties of all elements, look for connections between them, and ways the principles can be applied. Beck Elouin Farm was created by Perrine and Charles Herve Gruyer in 2006 in Normandy, France. The couple had never farmed before, but they wanted to live close to and respectfully with nature. They wanted to be a force for rebuilding the planet rather than destroying it. This is an overview of the farm in 2015. At a quarter acre, it is compact and diversified. They feel like pioneers who take the best of past and present techniques. The approaches they use are from 19th century Parisian market gardeners, Amazonian tribes people, and Asian efficient microorganisms related practices. It is an experimental and research farm and many studies are conducted on site. It's also a market garden. Their productivity is 10 times higher than that of mechanized organic farming, showing that permaculture gardens can produce good incomes. 
Charles says they stay humble and recognize there is not one truth, but 1,000 possible approaches. The gardens are a haven of biodiversity and a place of real joy and beauty to live and work. They say their exploration has led to something incredibly important for mankind, agriculture which is not just sustainable, but restorative. Since most people live in cities, urban permaculture is a big consideration. Urban gardening is growing in popularity. Patio gardens, rooftop gardens, and vertical gardens are being used in small spaces. People care about how their food is grown, the ethics involved in acquiring the food, the nutrition in it, and even the safety of it. There's also a realization that we are dependent upon specialized and delicate networks to bring food into cities. Fostering some self-reliance is smart in the event the system breaks down for any reason. This falls into the permaculture principle about planning for resiliency. Did you know about 50% of the food in Russia comes from the small country gardens, which total about 7% of their land? Community food forests are starting to pop up now. There's one in Seattle and one in Edmonton. Some people are addressing food deserts, which are areas where only fast food can be found in some poor inner cities. So, bus stop veggie stands are popping up, and mobile carts are bringing fresh produce in from neighboring farmers. Laws are being changed. In many urban locations, vegetable gardens were not allowed for many years. Neither were community gathering areas on public property. Natural and sustainable building design is considered in urban permaculture. Straw, bale, and cob buildings provide insulation values that are two to three times that of commercial fiberglass. If you want to learn more about ways permaculture can be applied to the city, I recommend Toby Hemingway's book, The Permaculture City. This is a picture of an earthship home, which is an autonomous, off-grid earthen home that utilizes solar and wind power. It recycles gray water and even treats black water sewage to use in plantings. The founder of Earthship Homes is Michael Reynolds. This is a picture of the most basic Earthship design called the Simple Survival. They do sell designs and teach courses, and they also do a lot of work in impoverished areas, building schools and community buildings. All the Earthship houses have a greenhouse in the hottest portion, which buffers the house and allows food to be grown. Heat is stored in the thermal mass in the walls to be discharged at night. This is an interior of one of the Earthship homes. These are pictures of the Earthship headquarters in Taos, New Mexico, where they have a community of homes. They use recycled material, and in these images they've used glass bottles in adobe walls quite beautifully. This is a photo of Corner Village in Portland. It was a project by City Repair, and the founder is Mark Lakeman. They painted the intersection, they built a free box library, and they put an information kiosk out. They also have a children's playhouse and a tea station. Permission to do it was denied, but a city politician gave them a permit for a weekend block party, and they ended up building this beautiful intersection. The mayor loved it. It slowed down traffic and really brought the community together. So this idea took off and can now be petitioned by your community if you're interested. Here's a picture of the solar-powered tea station before it became legal. City Repair spends a lot of time teaching communities how to do this work, and Mark Lakeman says it's about building relationships, not building stuff. This is an image of the Cobb Angel Bench, which is beside the tea station at Corner Village. 
City Repair works to create gathering places in public spaces. This is a big change from streets being a thoroughfare designed to keep people and vehicles moving. The streets are now safer, more livable, and walkable. This is an image of Toby Hemingway in front of a shared Cobb sauna. They now have more shared gardens in the area, more shared childcare. People help each other paint houses. They have a stronger community. They even have a depaving campaign to green areas with unneeded pavement. Communitecture is the architecture firm involved with city repair. They do sustainable creative design and natural cob design, and they create villages. In front of their office, there are 100 edible plants and trees in a mini food forest. Mark Lakeman says there are more than 700 public space interventions now, and no one knows the exact number. He's just happy it's getting out of control. Permaculture heals people. Natural gardening improves health and happiness. There's microbes in the soil that actually help you release serotonin. And the longest lived centenarians all do some form of natural gardening. These are the people that come from the blue zones. Gardening is among the best exercise you can get. You get fresh air, sunlight, you become in sync with nature's rhythms. You get to eat food with micro and phytonutrients that last only a short period of time. Plants respond to respectful care by growing better. You may have heard of the Cleve Baxter effect. He was a polygraph expert who showed that plants do indeed have sentience. When gardening, we communicate with our plants. We expose them to our voice. We might turn on genetic receptors through the DNA in our touch, sweat, and saliva. We might be encouraging them to grow for our individual health and benefit. Permaculture heals soil and makes food nutritious again. Dr. August Dunning conducted studies on mineral loss in food. The decline started with mechanized farming in the 1950s. It sharply declined again with pesticide, herbicide, and fungicide use, and then again with recent GMO and glyphosate use. Mineral loss is correlated with much higher disease, and today it takes 36 apples to get the same amount of iron you used to get from one apple in 1950. Permaculture brings minerals and nutrients back again into the living soil. Permaculture is organic, it utilizes polycultures, and typically doesn't till the soil, so it brings minerals and returns nutrients back again. Food becomes more nutritious and abundant as the permaculture garden matures. It also results in perpetual, beautiful, satisfying landscapes that nourish our minds, bodies, and souls. Mycelium is being used to clean waterways and contaminated soil. This is called mycoremediation. Oyster mushroom mycelium reduces E. coli and breaks down hydrocarbons. Garden giants remove mercury and heavy metals from soil and water. The lignin found in dense trees is of a similar structure to the toxins, so mushrooms are well adapted to clean the environment. Mycelium is like an underground neural network that connects plants and trees through their roots. It feeds them water and nutrients, like phosphorus. It helps them build immunity to bugs, and it allows them to communicate chemically through the network. They can warn each other when pests attack. It allows trees to support other trees in need and teach seedlings how to thrive. They can send carbon, water, and resources through this network. Mycelium even stops feeding pioneer plants when their time has come. In return for all this work, they get sugars from plants. Mycelium is invaluable to soil health, and tilling damages it and fertilizers do damage too. Some scientists are calling this the wood wide web, and the underground fungal internet can be very large. In fact, the largest living species on the planet 
is a honey fungus in Oregon, which is 2.4 miles across. Paul Stamets wrote a very interesting book called Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Save the World. Plants can also be used to clean the environment, and this is called phytoremediation. Microbial remediation is when bacteria are used to assist in breaking down toxins. This project, Healing the Cut, Bridging the Gap, was a project by Oliver Kellhammer, who is a knowledgeable permaculture instructor who also teaches at Parsons School of Design. In Vancouver, the Grandview Railway cut through a very lush wildlife area, so Vancouver held a competition for artists to forward ideas for decorating the new bridge in 1993. Oliver and Janice Bowley made a proposal to reforest the area and create a viewing platform for ecological restoration to be viewed from the bridge. They won the competition but couldn't start for several years. There were legal issues to iron out as it was an artistic and therefore copyrightable project. They wanted to pursue the intellectual property status so the forest would be protected as art. The image on the right shows what the forest looked like after it started to grow in. On the top left is an image of Oliver using willow and cottonwood cuttings, and they were just laid onto the soil and allowed to re-root. They also used bioengineering dam structures shown in the bottom left, where cuttings were staked in areas where water flowed, and it dammed and slowed the erosion and built the soil into plant forms. The bottom right shows the willow three months after planting, and the upper right shows nest boxes that were built for chickadees and swallows. They fertilized the area and brought in seeds that sprouted native plants. Reversing desertification is another area where permaculture is being applied such as the Screening the Desert project by Jeff Lawton. This is in Jaffa in the Dead Sea Valley of Jordan. It's a one-acre plot where Jeff and a crew of interns created a food forest, education center, and experimental permaculture plot. They built walls to collect silt during floods, they built swales, and they recycle gray water. They conserve the scarce water and nutrients in the built-up fertile soil. They created cooling microclimates to protect tender crops from the desert heat. They used composting toilets, chicken tractors, worm composting, and foraging ducks. There's a lot of success in the area, and the compost worms are being shared. Here's a picture of the chickens enjoying the shaded area under the canopy. Permaculture often integrates domestic animals. It places them on the land, as nature intended. Unlike in modern factory farms, the animals remain healthy and the land becomes enriched by their presence. They can carry out their health-giving, symbiotic relationship. Wild animals are not excluded. There is always an area left in the natural state in a permaculture plot. Many people plant extra food for the wild animals, and they in return enrich the land. Without birds and beneficial insects, the ecosystem would quickly get out of balance. Animal droppings add to the nutrients in the soil, and their gentle scratching is the best kind of tilling. Some gardeners will plant perimeter fruiting hedges and trees that may not be very palatable to people, but are appreciated by less discerning wildlife. Permaculture focuses on plants that are easy to grow and low maintenance, like hardy perennials and self-seeding plants. Eric Tonsmeyer wrote Perennial Vegetables. He searched the earth for useful perennials and wrote this fabulous resource. Some of the interesting plants you can consider are hardy kiwi, persimmons, pawpaw, northern nuts such as northern pecans, northern almonds, yellowhorn nuts, the linden tree, bay laurel tree, szechuan pepper tree, nodding onion and walking onion, 
tree kale or collard trees, Russian pomegranate, Chinese jujube, ice cream banana, hearty fig, chayberry, mulberries, the maypop passion fruit vine, gumi berries, goji berries, aronia and hacksap berries, josta berries, sea buckthorn, and nitrogen fixing trees like the autumn olive. If a plant is banned in your area, then certainly don't use it. But there is a movement to label certain hardy plants invasive and to wipe them out. According to some specialists, this is misguided and unnecessary. Animals and people have been moving plants around since the beginning of life. Most of our annual vegetables could be considered non-native. The plants labeled invasive are often pioneers that heal the soil, remove toxins, fix nitrogen, and prepare the land to become a climax forest once again. These plants normally only exist in areas where the land has been disturbed. Many are edible and useful. Some argue that they are less a threat than the toxic chemicals used to poison them. I encourage you to become aware and research who is funding the eradication of invasive species in your area. The planet is giving us feedback now that we need to address. The land, air, water, and creatures are clearly suffering from our untenable methods of interacting with the earth. Monocrop production and the use of poisons, plowing, and salting with fertilizers is breaking natural laws. The underlying ideologies that have for too long promoted human dominance, conquest, the use of technology unquestioningly, and the hoarding of natural resources are unreasonable, juvenile, and ultimately self-destructive. Industrial agriculture mines the soil for nutrients without efforts to heal and replenish it. It requires the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. These pollute and kill the smallest life forms, and the entire ecosystem is now suffering the consequences. When an insect attempts to devour a monocrop, they are not the enemy. They are actually assisting nature by removing the unnatural and unhealthy condition and encouraging diversity to return. Natural and permaculture landscapes can't be decimated by insects or animals because they encompass varied, healthy, and balanced ecosystems. They remediate previous soil damage, remove toxins from the environment, and bring life back into balance. I feel we have an obligation to address the global destruction and pain and to improve the lives of others, animals, and the entire planet. When we become conscious of a problem and aware of the solution, I feel we have a duty to act. Permaculture gives us a set of principles to help return our world to a respectful, cooperative paradise. We can become stewards that help create the unity and coherence that all life seeks. Permaculture reveals that the more we consider others and the earth, and the more we share, the more there is for us and for every inhabitant of the planet. To me, it's about recognizing our interconnectedness and oneness. When we embrace the relationship between each and all, life reflects that unison back to us and we experience resonance and harmony. When we all comprehend our connection, the earth will become a loving paradise. Many permaculture specialists allowed me to use their photos and talk about their work. My gratitude goes out to them and to all of you who are busy making the world a better place.